So thanks a lot. It's a pleasure for me to share with you some of the um, results, in fact, that we are uh, getting from the Planck mission. Um, so my contribution will be mostly the contribution of the experimentalist in this discussion. Um, everybody knows this very important image of the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. This is a very deep field of uh, galaxies. Some of the galaxies that are um, hardly visible here are as far as uh, uh, 11 or 12 billion light years away. So we have a view of the early universe which is already structured in galaxies. And we know that the, the, the space is expanding, as Bernard already pointed out. We have uh, a long heritage from Hubble and also from Lemaitre, who anticipated possibly this uh, evidence. Now we have uh, extremely solid and independently verified evidence that the universe is expanding. Uh, we also have a treasure of uh, knowledge and uh, of uh, information that we get from the early universe from the very background of the visible universe. What here appears as black has been shown to actually uh, contain a very soft but measurable uh, energy in photons that we observe in the microwave. And Pences and Wilson were the first one to detect accidentally, as it happens. Sometimes reality brings in, uh, you know, something new that we didn't even expect. And uh, now we have uh, a long tradition of observation of the microwave background, which is a very solid um, piece of information that we get directly from the boundary of the observable universe. We have seen this already a number of times today. So uh, we are in a generic point in the universe. It appears to the center because this is a space-time diagram. And uh, we have the possibility to have a uh, cut through the entire history of the universe. Um, and. Uh, so we are here about 13.8 billion years after the beginning of the expansion of the universe. Um, and what we see as the ultimate uh, region from which we receive the photons of the cosmic microwave background is the phase of uh, the universe when there was a transition between an opaque and hot universe uh, as a plasma state to a transparent universe after the first combination of electrical particles, electrons, and nuclei. Um, so we have really a direct vision of the universe when it was about uh, 380,000 years old. That's about 0.003% of the present age of the universe. That's remarkable. We have this cosmic view, and uh, we try to make this story as complete as possible by observing what nature gives us to observe and making a synthesis of it. And the observations that were crucial, a crucial step were um, the uh, observation from the Cosmic uh, Background Explorer satellite from NASA in 1992. Um, another Nobel Prize after Pences and Wilson, also John Mother, George Wood got this Nobel Prize for uh, their results. And what I will concentrate on is the anisotropy of the microwave background. This was the first time that this little deviation for com from complete uniformity were detected uh, by Kobe. Um, and that is when uh, Planck started. Uh, when we started back in 1992, I actually was working with George Smoot in Berkeley, and that was exactly the time when we conceived the experiment that now is leading more, some 22 years later to results. And <clears throat> the point is that we uh, realized that by having a higher angular resolution in this map, we could get a lot of information. So why Planck? Um, after the detection, we realized 
people realize more and more uh, thoroughly that really the bulk of the information that the microwave background uh, radiation contains is still to be explored. And in fact, if you, can see, if you look at this, is a, just a sketch of what pr uh, theory predicts for the uh, statistics of the fluctuations in the microwave background based on the physics of the early universe, where you have gravity acting especially on dark matter and uh, uh, radiation pressure that uh, uh, reacts, and you have these oscillations, we call them acoustic oscillations. And these oscillations uh, mean density perturbation and velocity perturbation, and you can work out the physics, which is relatively simple, at least in principle, and you can derive the statistics that you expect in a map like this uh, as a function of the angular scale, okay? This is the angular size in the sky, which we used multiples in the harmonic spheric, uh, spherical harmonic expansion. The L uh, is the inverse, essential of the angle. And so the fact is that COBE only detected fluctuations on scale of about seven degrees the smallest detail you can see here is about seven degrees in the sky, which is not a very good resolution, right? And uh, seven degrees are larger scales. So what Kobe probed was only this part of the spectrum. And all this information, the peaks and the valleys here, which depend on the physics and therefore on the kind of medium in which this oscillation happen are all at higher angular resolution. So if you can get a very precise map with angular resolution that goes, you, so, you see, like a, a, a small fraction of a degree, you really cover the entire spectrum. That was the idea of Planck. You can see here that if you change the, con the matter and energy content in the early universe, depending on which kind of matter and which kind of energy contribute to the total energy of the, of the initial plasma, you get different, uh, quantitatively different shapes of this spectrum. The general shape is that we have a family of curves that is possible. But if you change, for example, matter density or curvature or neutrino mass and stuff like that, all these contribute, and there is a lot of information there. So really, uh, the the... Uh, main purpose of, of Planck was to get uh, this precision measurement of the spectrum. These are uh, some drawing that I made, uh, some of these I made myself um, long ago and after some 17 years of work by hundreds of people. We started a few of us, but now this is a big, big experiment. And after uh, many, many years, this is what um, we launched. The launch w was in uh, uh, almost exactly uh, five years ago. It was um, in May uh, 2009. This is the flight model. This is a, a, a very sophisticated satellite, one of, one of the most sophisticated complex uh, uh, hardware, space hardware that has been produced so far. Uh, it has a telescope of 1.5 meter diameter. Uh, it gets these uh, microwave photons that come from the bottom of the universe after some 14 billion years travel. And some of them get to the telescope and then get, uh, get reflected to this secondary mirror, which uh, reflects them on the focal plane, which is over here. And you can see the focal plane uh, enlarged here. We have two instruments, low and high frequency instruments to cover a wide spectral range. I will come back to that. And these are cooled down to very low temperature. Uh, the heart of the bolometer array goes to 0.1 Kelvin, so a tenth of a Kelvin above absolute zero. And this has been an extreme technological challenge for, for Planck. This is a, an ESA project, and you can see the uh, the slogan here is looking back to the dawn of time, which is really what we are trying to do here. So it's been a long story since 1992. Um, a lot of work, a lot of collaboration, a lot of people, a lot of human relationships, a lot of people who really believe that this is worth, worthwhile. 
you have to believe that this is worthwhile to do it. And then we launched in uh, uh, 14 May of uh, five years ago, and then we had some four years of observations. And this is uh, just the list of the uh, some 400 people that have been working on this. This is just a picture of, it, of the so-called core team, the people sort of fully dedicated to, to the mission. And these are the various inst institutions. Um, the launch is a critical moment, as you can imagine. Uh, everything was perfectly uh, uh, functional and things were uh, working very well. The Ariane 5 uh, launcher brought the satellite to the L2 orbit, which is one and a half million kilometers away from the Earth, to be in a very protected region in the sense of a very low background and no influence from the Earth. The Earth looks very small from there. And uh, as soon as the satellite went out in orbit, uh, um, uh, the, there was another dramatic or critical time, which is the um, detachment of the satellite from the uh, support of the Ariane uh, uh, shroud. And you can see that uh, the satellite gets a spin and uh, after uh, a few weeks of uh, trip to L2, uh, what uh, we got is a satellite that for some four years has been doing always the same movement, as you can see here, just spinning on itself with a rate of one round per minute. And so every minute, it, it essentially scans a, a thin circle in the sky and we get a, a, you know, a, a little slice, if you like, of the bottom of the universe, as the animation can show you. But then, since the satellite is following the Earth as the Earth rev revolves around this, the sun, every six months or so, the eye, the telescope, covers the entire sphere, right? So every, every six months, we have a full sky map of the, uh, of the microwave background, and we do that uh, for uh, four years, so that means eight different surveys, and that's extremely important. This is the galaxy, you see, the galaxy uh, you can see in the optical. Also in the microwave, we do get uh, galactic emission, and so that is a, a disturbance. And this is why we have several frequencies, because we have to disentangle the radiation that comes from nearby um, uh, emission, this is mostly dust and synchrotron emission from our galaxy. And what we really want is the background, is the, is the light that comes from the very uh, far, farthest regions of the universe. This is a, an image that we released in the summer of 2010. Uh, but uh, the science analysis that we can do requires separation, as I was mentioning, of the so-called foreground emission, the galaxy, extragalactic sources, everything that is in between us and the, and the bottom of the sky. So this is why we have these different frequencies from one centimeter to a fraction of a millimeter. We have nine different uh, frequencies. And by combining all the information that is present in, the, in these various maps, uh, we, we, we can, there, there are a number of different statistical approaches to disentangle uh, local radiation from cosmic microwave background. And uh, uh, this is a delicate process, but we, we have uh, very good handles and verification because we use different methods and we compare them in the end. And so the end result is this uh, beautiful map uh, which, as you can see, has much finer details than the Kobe one. And uh, this was released on the 21st of March of uh, 2013, and uh, it immediately captured the attention not only of the scientific community, but uh, also of uh, some of the major newspapers. This is the next day front page of a number of newspapers. But this plot that has been already shown a couple of times is really the, uh, um, the primary quantitative uh, uh, synthesis of our mission, or one of them, I would say the most important so far. And, and you can see, once again, I mean, this is really astonishing. I have to tell you, I mean, as I told you, I've been working on this for so many years, 
And every time I look at this, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. I mean, we are looking at something that is very difficult to, you know, this kind of agreement between observations and what, a, let's say, a model gives you, a, a physically meaningful model gives you, is very difficult to obtain, in a, even in a laboratory. And we are doing this with the photons that traveled for 14 billion years. I mean, it's unbelievable. And the, and the physics that is um, verified by this observation is physics that uh, tells us about processes that were going on in the first 0.003% of the life of the universe. Now, uh, What's in here is quantitative information. Quantitative information that leads us to uh, uh, pinpoint the value of the parameters that describe the component of energy and matter in the universe and curvature. You can fit, given the amount of information you can see there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, perhaps even eight different peaks of this acoustic pattern that comes from these oscillations that I was mentioning, right? And the amount, the, the leverage that you have on a plot like this allows you to uh, resolve with high accuracy for several parameters. The basic lambda CDM model has six parameters. And what you see here, the green curve, is a, a fit of six parameters. And, and all of them are pinpointed with very good uh, accuracy. OK? And so one thing I wanted to mention is that um, the first peak, what happens here? These are harmonics of the first peak. But the first peak is interesting. Is the, horizon, is the scale of the horizon at the last scattering. It means what we are seeing here is physics becoming active in the universe because gravity is acting on a scale that is causally connected. Before, he, before this, at uh, scales that are larger than this, there is a, a, a you know, the, the, the gravity did not have the time yet to act on matter. And so what you get here, really, is where uh, is, a, is, a, is a state in which we find the universe as it was in the initial conditions. Okay, so we, in a sense, here we have a direct signature of the horizon as a physical reality. And we can get this, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, plot where w w we can summarize the uh, content of matter and energy, at least the, the major components. And as we know, uh, only about 5% uh, is baryons and 96% is between dark matter and dark energy. And we can measure this with, with a really uh, great accuracy and get an age of the universe. And we should, rem we should remember this. I mean, this is a feat that is marvelous, 95% uh, of which is due to something that we don't know. Okay, and we are looking for extra universes, but let's also remember that we have one universe that you can actually probe that is still quite mysterious, okay? We, we know a lot. I mean, I, I think I, I, I could communicate my, my personal surprise every time I see this. So there is something that we are really understanding, okay? But there is also something that really needs to be understood in our universe. The, 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 the floor is really open. We should not be narrow-minded and think that we have solved the mysteries of our universe, I think. I'm an experimentalist, eh? so I, I keep my feet on the ground, you know. Um, six parameters that fit perfectly or not perfectly, nothing is perfect. Very well, extremely well. This incredible information content in that, in that plot, in that power spectrum. Six parameters, very simple universe. 
You know, it's a very simple scenario that we have in this, you know, ultimate large scale. And that, that reminds me of the simplicity that we hand, have on the other side of our observable universe, which is the, the you know, the uh, particle, uh, uh, subatomic particle scale. After all, with only a relatively small number of parameters, we describe the, 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 you know, the tissue of the universe in a sense and the scale, large scale uh, behavior. But uh, uh, can you give me like 10 minutes war warning when I, because I, I don't want to take too much time. Okay, uh, anyway, uh, what are, I, I, now I wanted, I wanted to use this, which is a very important plot, uh, to, uh, to uh, make some, um, some comments and, and, and some uh, considerations. What are the observational and fundamental limits that we find when we want to observe the universe or let's say the large scale universe as we do in the cosmic microwave background. Okay, the, this formula here it tells you the uh, fractional uh, accuracy with which you can recover the, these points. This is, this is C of L is exactly the, the uh, contrast, the anisotropy measure, okay? And you, you can see this is, has three factors. One is the fraction of the sky that you can observe. Of, obviously, you would like this to be one, but it's never one because we have foregrounds. We are within a galaxy. And, and, and this can disturb, can perturb your, your, your measurement and, and it may fool you because you see fluctuations that appear to be from the background, but there are some residual from our galaxy. So there is always something less than one here. Then you have your instrument. Your instrument is never perfect. Okay, I, I, I will come back to this. And then we have cosmic variance. John already uh, mentioned this, okay? So uh, let me just give you this uh, picture here, which is a simulation, is, is a realistic simulation of an observation. And you can see here the cosmic variance is hitting you at very large scales. You see, it goes as the square root of 1 over L, essentially, where L is the inverse of theta, of the angle, right? So this is the large scale. You have only one universe to observe. You have only a few large scale patches in the sky to compare to each other. So your statistics is very poor. And this is in inevitable. There is no better instrument that can get rid of this. On the other hand, over here, we are limited by um, sensitivity of the instrument and the angular resolution. These are these, these two parameters. And indeed, here, a better instrument can improve, okay? This is done with a full fraction of the sky. But in the end, there will always be some limit here, right? So let's take this. How can we improve? What is, where are we? And what is the prospect for the future? to make more and more precise measurements. Interestingly, there is a quantum limit to how well your instrument can observe. You see, there is a fundamental limit that enters your experimental apparatus because your noise temperature cannot be better than H nu over K, essentially. And these are fundamental constants. Eh? There is no uh, good engineer that can break this, okay? So there is a limit here. So how can we get better sensitivity if there is an ultimate limit? By making many receivers, right? And that's exactly what the people are doing. Planck has about 50. You have seen the focal plane there. This is what is being done. This is bicep one and this is bicep two. I will come back to this experiment. And in the future, you can see the number of detectors you can sort of see down here goes to several thousands. And so we can really try to improve more and more uh, in that direction. And angular resolution. Uh, as I said, Planck was 
uh, a step forward from Kobe, we also had a very success, successful and important mission that is WMAP. WMAP and Planck made extreme progress compared to Kobe, especially thanks to the angular resolution. That's why we have a 1.5 meter telescope, right? And Planck goes also to a high frequency, and that helps a lot with the resolution, okay? So this is for this part. Uh, let's go to this. Okay, I already mentioned that. We need very good component separation, as we call it. We have to make sure that the fraction of the sky is clean. Otherwise, we are biased. We have systematic effects in our results. And this is why we have so many frequencies there, okay? Uh, cosmic variance, well, we have only one sky. That is a fundamental limit. Now, let me say something that would uh, explain to you why we are so bold in our uh, talking about Planck as a definitive measurement of the temperature power spectrum. The reason is that for Planck, this part, the instrumental part, is small compared to the cosmic variance, down to an L of 2,500. That means the entire spectrum, essentially, is dominated by uncertainty, which is fundamental. There is no better experiment that can do better, you see? So in that sense, it's a definitive measurement. Now, let me... Uh, go now a bit deeper on what happens in this region, right? Which everyone is, for some reason, everyone is so interested in that initial universe, in the origin, right? We are all touched by that. Now, uh, clearly the photon horizon is the last scattering surface from which we receive the microwave background radiation. But from the properties of what we see here and taking physics as far as we can use it, theory, we can try to dig into this hot initial phase of the universe. And so we have evidence, direct evidence of what happens here when the universe becomes transparent. And you, you notice what detailed <laughs> evidence we can have from there. But then we can say, okay, a few thousand years after the Big Bang, that's when matter started to dominate over radiation. And that's when, you know, the, the structuring of the universe in galaxies and structures started really back in the hot plasma, thanks to dark matter. And then if you go even before, we know quite a lot, again, about nucleosynthesis, just a few minutes. Uh, and then, Neutrinos, one second, John already mentioned this. If we had a good telescope, maybe someday uh, we will be able to measure the microwave neutrino background to back to one second. And then um, we have, uh, you know, the uh, formation of, of uh, protons and neutrons from quarks, and then we go back to, you know, a fraction of a, nan of a nanosecond when the forces started to uh, disentangle from each other. And then th this very interesting, uh, potentially uh, um, very important uh, uh, opportunity for us to uh, verify this, this uh, scenario of inflation that goes back to 10 to the minus 35 seconds. And then again, more speculative, uh, what happens in terms of grand unification in the back to the, to the uh, quantum gravity era, to the Planck time. Now, um, there is a, 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 a really a, a, a very, very interesting opportunity to test inflation uh, in, a, in a more direct way, and that is through gravitational waves that inflation uh, would have produced. This has already been mentioned, so I will be quick about that. But essentially, what we, what we can hope to see is a, a signature in the microwave background uh, that is imprinted from the very, very early universe in this phase, in this exponentially expanding uh, scenario of inflation that would produce gravitational waves with a uh, imprint on the microwave background that is distinguishable in principle from 
other sources of polarization in the microwave background, okay? This is a similar spectrum as a just, uh, uh, let's say, the, the model, but you can see the polarization spectrum, similar to the one of temperature. Again, this is uh, uh, multiple, so these are large scale, these are small scales, and this is, uh, you, you can see two different curves. This EE is basi basically uh, polarization that is produced from density perturbation, okay? So essentially what produces this fluctuation in the polarized component of the microwave background is the same that produces the temperature ones. It's the quadrupolar component that produces this uh, polarized fraction, which is about 10% or so. This has been measured already by a number of experiments. I will show you what, how well we measure this with Planck, although the analysis is not ready for scientific exploitation yet. It will, it will be in a few months, but I can show you that. Um, and down here, you can see this BB. This is uh, produced by vector, per, by tensor per perturbations. And you have, you have these two bumps, you know, due to re, um, reionization and recombination. And there's this bigger bump, uh, which is actually produced by lensing, uh, by structure that is between us and the microwave background. But detecting either of these two bumps, possibly both, if, if possible, it would really mean that we are seeing a signature directly from the inflation epoch. Or something that is compatible with that. It would be nice to have, you know, discussions about what else could, could produce B modes in the microwave background. Uh, certainly, our galaxy can, foregrounds can, and lensing, which is not, you know, primordial. This is just, let's say, a contamination, if you like, from the nearby universe again. It's not our galaxy, but still it's contamination compared to what we want to do in these terms. How can we distinguish such a small signal? We are talking about, uh, you know, 10 nano Kelvin. It's incredible, huh? But there is a, an opportunity because uh, these kind of perturbations have a statistical pattern that is distinguishable from the uh, density perturbation. And this is what allows, in principle, us to make a specific analysis to look for these kind of, of uh, signatures at very, very low level. Now, a problem is that, of course, inflation is a nice idea, but there is no well-defined prediction of the energy scale at which it would occur. So theory does not predict a range. And so we don't know if and where these bumps are visible. Now, this experiment has come up very recently with astonishing um, claim that those patterns are actually uh, visible in their maps. This is uh, bicep two from the South Pole. And this was, uh, as you all know, a, a recent uh, um, uh, release that was made. <clears throat> now, let me just uh, point out that this is an experiment that is looking a, a, a small region in the sky, a few percent of the sky, really. And uh, it's doing this in a very clever way because uh, they, they uh, have uh, searched for a very clean region where there is very little fo foreground radiation in our galaxy. Uh, but they observe from the Earth. So the, uh, the atmosphere is transparent only in a few spectral bands. And in fact, the, all these data come from one single frequency, which is 150 gigahertz. And this is due to the atmospheric, uh, um, let's say, limitation. There, there are other bands that now are being used for uh, cross-checks. And in fact, BICEP1 uh, was at a different uh, scale. And they also did some cross-check with that. But mainly, the result comes from 150. And you can see their data here. This is the bump at L of about 100 that I showed you before. And this is their analysis of uh, potential residual foreground contamination from dust. Dust of, uh, you know, from which we get stars and a lot of uh, uh, important and interesting physics. But in this case, it's an enemy. Eh? It's a big enemy because 
it uh, uh, can mimic, uh, you know, uh, polarized uh, uh, signatures. So their analysis is, is this, but this is really based on um, data that um, are pre very preliminary um, and uh, rather than data, this, uh, this is really from a, a model of, of dust. Um, uh, so uh, obviously now uh, we are in the Planck uh, collaboration working uh, very uh, intensively in, in two fronts. One is, uh, of course, to check very carefully this region. We have much more visibility on the foregrounds as we have nine frequencies, as I told you. And, uh, um, and also, of course, we are analyzing our very low L part as well as here with, uh, with the analysis that uh, as in our plan, the polarization release is expected by uh, the end of this year, basically October is the deadline that uh, we agreed with ESA. So that is the time frame in which uh, uh, we uh, will release. Um, unless we find something really robust and worth mentioning earlier. Okay, so that's the, that's the plan. So this is how well Planck measures that spe the correlation between temperature and E mode polarization. You can see once again, this is, <laughs> this is another incredible thing. And what is amazing here, Okay, this is the E mode, eh? this is the E mode, remember? This is the, this part, let's say the classical part, not the inflationary part. But that, that gives you an idea of the accuracy on polarization that Planck can achieve. And what is uh, incredible, uh, uh, or not incredible, what is nice, <laughs> but is really nice, is that the, the red curve that you see here is not a best fit to this data. But this is the model that you get from the six parameters that you get from the temperature. Okay? So this is coming exactly from the same uh, parameter set that I showed you before. So once again, we are understanding something. There is no question about that. We need to uh, be open-minded about how deep uh, this observation can lead us and how much they could change our vision of what we think about the universe. So analysis is going on, as I said. I wanted to show this image that was released, in fact, uh, uh, I guess two days ago. <laughs> yes, this is a, a PR image, okay? This is not for science, but it does capture a lot of science that Planck is doing and will do on polarization because this shows the um, galactic magnetic field. The magnetic field is responsible for the uh, polarization of the radiation that we receive from two different physical mechanisms. One is a synchrotron you know, from electrons on, in, the, in, in the galactic uh, magnetic field. And the other one is dust at two different uh, frequency with two different instruments, in fact. We have a, a very good match and we can reconstruct the structure of the galactic uh, magnetic field in a way that was not possible before. Now, you notice that the high galactic latitude where contamination is low and where, in fact, bicep 2 is observing are missing here, and, and this is obviously because this requires so much more attention because the signal to noise is so small that we need to make sure that one, once we come out with these results, we have checked them very, very carefully, okay? Um, so, okay, I still, oh, excellent, okay. So, um, sorry about this, I don't know why this slide doesn't, come out fine, but um, I just wanted to mention one thing more that Planck is able to do for the first time. Uh, we know that, uh, we believe that 95% of the stuff that makes the universe is still unknown. Dark energy is much more unknown, I would say, than dark matter in the sense that dark matter reveals itself in a number of different uh, physically well understood uh, uh, situations. Eh? So uh, 
This is a new one. This is a new way to look at dark matter thanks to Planck, which is unique. Because what we have been able to do is to use gravitational lensing. You know, gravitational lensing, we, we do that uh, routinely uh, by observing clusters of galaxies, for example, that have very large mass and distort background sources. And we, so astrophysicists do that routinely to measure the mass of clusters of galaxies and so on. Uh, what we could do is to use gravitational lensing not from a, a far distant source, but from the microwave background itself. And what is lensing? What is producing the lensing that uh, distorts space, you know, according to general relativity, and gives us a, a statistically different pattern than we would expect otherwise? It's all the matter, everything that is between us and the last scattering surface. And so by doing that in different patches of the sky, and obviously with not a great resolution because it requires a lot of averaging to do that, but we get a map, which is shown here, in which darker region and uh, uh, whiter regions tell us where in the universe as a whole, in the different uh, uh, directions, we have more or less dark matter between us and the last scattering surface. So it's, it's like making a, a tomography of the entire universe, in a sense, using lensing um, from the microwave background radiation. And we can do quantitative work on this, because you can construct the power spectrum, okay? Obviously, everything is averaged in the line of sight, but you can measure statistically the uh, pattern that you see, and then you can compare this with large-scale mapping of galaxies, quasars, and so on, and there is a remarkable agreement. So again, we are unifying different fields, different angles through which we see these very faint signals like dark matter. So in a sense, we see dark matter, you see? We, we, we are getting a response from reality that tells us something that makes sense or that could not have made sense. I think this is essential for science to go on. One more thing that could be of interest in this discussion. Uh, we, in the, in the, in the fine-tuning debate, one of the uh, typical uh, instances that is discussed is uh, constants, no? constants of nature. Are they really constant? Uh, why are they uh, what they are? Do they change in time? Do they change if we go to very far region in the universe? Well, it's difficult to answer that, but it is possible to try and test that. Uh, John has been a precursor of this, but. Uh, we, with, we could, with Planck data, um, measure the, or put limits, actually, as you can see, there is no detected deviation on, on the uh, uh, fine structure constant, alpha. Huh? And you can see that the degeneracy with uh, Hubble constant or with the baryon density, and you can see essentially that we can put limit at the level of a percent in possible deviations. If Nature was such that alpha would change the, uh, on, the, on the scale of the observable universe for more than a percent, then this would show up here some, somehow. Okay, so that's a, a really uh, profound uh, uh, possibility of testing um, in the structure of, of, uh, of our universe. Uh, there are also things that surprise us. Uh, you know this map now, you've seen that many times, and it is true that it uh, does appear as a uniformly uh, distributed uh, uh, power in the full sky. However, uh, and which is consistent with you know, everything we assume about the universe, that there is no preferred direction okay, in large scale universe. But if you if I uh, go through this picture like this, look at the, look at the laser, okay? 
you may agree with me that what is below is a little bit more diverse than what is above this line, okay? Do you agree? Could be. Maybe. Now, I'm not tracing this line just to separate these two parts. This is, in fact, two hemispheres in the sky. And this is surprising. It is not a very strong statistical signal. It's about three sigma. Do you believe three sigma? Maybe. But you may want to take that uh, seriously. And there are people who are taking this seriously and are wondering why. Uh, probably somebody already uh, mentioned this spot here. This is uh, statistically uh, a bit far from you know, the typical fluctuations that we have. This is another anomaly. The other third anomaly that we see is that um, the power at the, in, the low, uh, in the large scales is a little bit lower than is expected from uh, the uh, typical six parameters model. So while we do confirm with great accuracy the uh, standard model, there are also uh, new things that surface somehow. And it's always good to see that there are new open questions. So I'm going to uh, uh, get close to my conclusion. And I just wanted to add a few comments about uh, methodology that is being uh, discussed and will be discussed more and more. So clearly we have an uh, inflation scenario, uh, scenario which is very promising. It's a very brilliant idea. It's uh, a pity, if, from my point of view as an experimentalist, that there is no competition really at these days. It would be very nice to have another way of looking at it, uh, uh, this data, that uh, could force more and more, uh, you know, to uh, deepen the uh, understanding and the possibility of testing things. Uh, and as we know, um, inflation uh, connects uh, quite naturally uh, uh, to this multiverse scenario that is, you know, a big uh, fashion these days. And uh, there are very different uh, forms of, uh, of multiverse scenarios. And uh, indeed, it is something that should be taken with very open mind, I think. It is a possibility that we should uh, contemplate. And we have seen such a very beautiful example in history how you know, it is important not to, to, be, uh, uh, to have uh, preconceptions of any kind. Uh, on the other hand, it is true as far as we know now that this other universe will be causally disconnected. And John put out a number of <laughs> 10 to the 10 to the 77 or something that would give us an idea of, of something that uh, uh, might uh, uh, contradict the, the, this disconnection. Uh, and it is true that anthropic selection gives us an opportunity to explain um, the fine tuning that is so surprising for life. I would say for life, I don't know about consciousness really. I mean, consciousness is such a big word, you know? And sometimes we use it as you know, as water or, I don't know. It is, it is something that should be used with consciousness. <laughs> um, so it seems that with uh, multiverse and anthropic selection, many difficult problems of uh, physics that surface today in physics can be explained. For example, the values of the physical constants. There is a debate whether you, know, you really need such a large universe in which the constants are so constant for anthropic selection to work. But I, I don't know. I, 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 but certainly, the fact that uh, those constants are right is well explained by an anthropic selection. Also, the structure of the laws of physics would be well explained. Uh, uh, Bernard mentioned the triple alpha as a, as a star example, but today really it's difficult to find an area of physics <laughs> in which you don't incur somehow in this connection with an anthropic issue, right? 
This is remarkable. Actually, this is a question I have. Is there any area in which it doesn't really matter? I don't know if anyone has looked at this with uh, some systematicity. Anyway, this seems to be well explained by, um, by uh, anthropic selection. Also, for example, dark energy. A slightly different value of dark energy would uh, disrupt an hospitable universe. Is that a good conclusion, though? I mean, does that mean that we don't have to search anymore for a fundamental or more specific reason why dark energy is what it is? It seems too easy to me, frankly. Let me give you another example. Matter-antimatter asymmetry, okay? One part in 10 billion. This is what all the universe that we know is made of. People have been looking for fundamental you know, reasons why such an asymmetry occurs in a specific way, in a testable way. But why do we need that? We obviously need some you know, survivors, baryons, to have life and to have consciousness. So maybe we should not worry about that. So this is the kind of sentiment I want to convey to you. I mean, this is all very interesting. I see a risk of, you know, throwing away all the difficult problems into this anthropic selection issue. Is that good for our way of knowing the universe or not? Is there something that cannot be explained through anthropic selection? These are my questions. And uh, so I think being aware of selection effect is crucial. I mean, every astronomer, every graduate student in astronomy should know this extremely well. And this applies, why not, also to cosmology, why not? Uh, speculation has always been a positive element in the research and, and in science. So we should be open-minded. But I think that uh, um, testability multiple independent confirmation of really observed data, experience, are, I think, still should be, in my opinion, as an experimentalist, the key uh, criteria for a credibility of a scientific claim. And I think different interpretations should be confronted openly, also putting out the, the weak points you know, experimentalists tend to point out their weak points more than theorists, in my opinion. And every, everyone should be actually discussing about the weak points, the open points, because this is where we can make more progress. Every time I have the feeling that the whole universe has been understood and there are no really pressing issues, uh, I, I'm a little uncomfortable. So I think I like Jean Guitton's uh, quote, the reasonable person is one uh, who submits reason to experience. And uh, final question, is science the only way to gain genuine knowledge of reality? I mean, these are really big questions, eh? but uh, I would say that consciousness, and I think we should use this with consciousness, meaning that consciousness is not a category. Consciousness brings with it personal existence. It's me and you. Otherwise, we are cheating. We are talking about abstract terms, but we are not realizing what we are talking about. It's you and your wife and those you love. This is what is consciousness. And consciousness brings entirely new level of questions, I think. You, you, you may be willing to call them physics, maybe in a thousand years. I don't care what, how we call it. I think it's fair to say they are entirely different from what we now call physics, okay? And these are out, outside the limits of the scientific method as we know it now. I, I, don't, I don't have a crystal sphere to know what will happen in a thousand years. So questions about meaning, value, and nature of the single person. I like that because it is not the species, it's the personal existence, what consciousness is about. It's you and me. And 
uh, uh, as a consequence, that brings in also motivation for new knowledge and beauty of nature. We are curious about the universe, but we are human beings who are curious about the universe. And so I would like to finish with two quotes. One is from Max Planck, of course, the satellite is devoted to, to Planck. So he had a, a, a vivid uh, a sense of the need of this sympathy with reality, of this wonder for reality, for science to work. Those who have reached the stage of no longer being able to marvel at anything simply show that they have lost the art of reasoning and reflection. And finally, I'd like a, a, a poet, because it is amazing to see, again, ourselves in this uh, large uh, and moving and fascinating universe. And after having looked around, we go back to our little place where we contemplate all of this. And I like uh, Thomas Eliot's words, we shall not cease from exploration. And at the end of our exploring, we will, uh, the end of our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. Thank you. Thank you very much.